Sonia Rocador is an associate professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Texas, Austin. And since completing her PhD in comparative literature at New York University, she has published three books. One is in a book in English and in Portuguese. It's a, basically the same book in the two languages. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, always change. Entitled in English, Domestic Servants in Literature and Testimony in Brazil, 1889 to 1999, published by Paul Grave. And Macmillan and uh, Domestica Imaginaria Literatura e Testimonio e a Invenção da Empregada Doméstica no Brasil, uh, published by uh, the University of Brasilia. In addition to that, she's written about Poéticas eh, de Empobrecimento, a escrita derradeira uh, de Clarice Lisperto, that was published in 2002 by Ada Bloom. Um, she, her articles have appeared in a number of peer-reviewed journals, such as Revista de Crítica Literaria Latinoamericana, Afro-Hispanic Review, Lusa Brazilian Review, Ellipse, Journal of American Portuguese Studies Association, and Revista das de Letras. Uh, her current book project discusses the overlap of discourses on immigration and slavery and servitude in order to reveal the cross-cultural, the cross-currents of the Portuguese and African diaspora in Brazil. And before uh, uh, asking her to, uh, to speak, I'd also like to say that um, many of you might know that the um, Brazilian Studies Association, which is the, an international association, that, interdisciplinary association which studies Brazil, is housed at Brown for five years. The Secretariat is operating here, and we organize um, the last international conference. The next one will be in Rio in 2018, and we're very, very excited that the University of Texas Austin, under the leadership of Sonia Roncador and Marcelo Paixão, have uh, offered to host uh, our 15th international conference in Austin, Texas in March of 2020. So those of you who are scholars of Brazil, uh, junior scholars, senior scholars, will have an opportunity to submit a call for uh, a paper, for the call for papers, and perhaps go to Texas to <coughs> present there. So we're really happy of this collaboration between Texas and Brown University. So with no further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Sonia Honcador. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction and for the invitation, Ramon, for organizing uh, this event. It's a pleasure to, to be here today and see some of my dear uh, colleagues in the field. Um, the, the topic today has to do with my, my new research. Uh, I'm studying uh, Portuguese immigration in Brazil, uh, Trinidad and, and Hawaii. So this is part of one of uh, the chapters of this book. So. Um, uh, any comment will be very welcome. Uh, so the talk today is in English, um, and um, I slightly changed the title, and it's uh, Why Trash a Brasileira? I'm kind of uh, uh, working with this uh, idea of, uh, of a white trash uh, uh, population in Brazil. Uh, whiteness, uh, immigration, and <coughs> acclimatization in 19th century Rio. Okay, um, in a letter, um, can you can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, because I'm not gonna use. I, I think I have a loud voice. So yeah. Okay. All right. In a letter dated August 29, uh, 1863, on the legal and social disenfranchisement of Portuguese immigrants in Brazil, General Counsel José Henrique Ferreira accounts for the demeaning work conditions and dubious racial status of his unfortunate compatriots. Uh, and I'm quoting this uh, uh, counsel. And neither do the slaves treat the Portuguese immigrants respectfully, informs him. Because the slave owners hire the Portuguese to perform the most disdainful of all chores and are always prone to curse them as rogue sailors Slaves call these immigrants white Negroes, in Portuguese, negros brancos. The Portuguese Council's critical portrayal of these immigrants debasing realities, in particular his insinuation of their equivocal association to whiteness, evokes two well-known assumptions in the field of critical whiteness studies. The first one emphasizes the non-correspondence between race and skin color, or according to Matthew Fry uh, Jackson, Jacobson, sorry, recognizes the existence of systems of racial difference by which one might be both white and ra racially distinct from other whites. 
Second, the second supposition relies on the intersectionality of, why, um, of race and class-based processes of racial differentiation and challenges the parameters of whiteness that frame this concept as monolithic and uniformly associated with social privilege and power. Implied in both assumptions is the premise that people can gain or lose white privilege and capital as they move across different social cultural circumstances. In this sense, the Portuguese Council's comment on white Negro immigrants uh, within the hostile Brazilian work environment seems to associate this immigrant's social predicament with a form of racism regardless of their skin color. Previous scholarship on the system of racial classification in Brazil had already questioned the purely descriptive function of the term Negro in popular epithets such as Black Indian, Negro, uh, uh, Indio Negro, formerly used as a generic reference to indigenous slaves, also known as Negros da Terra, which is in English, blacks from the land, in opposition to Negros da Guiné, or African slaves. In other words, as Robin Sheriff argues, the epithet in question, that is, Indio Negro, black Indians, tells us that Negro worked not solely as a descriptive term indicating someone's skin color, but also as a pejorative racialized marker of non-whites of a servo status. Despite the, scar the scarcity of scholarship on indentured servitude in mid to late 19th century Brazil, it is acknowledged that the elite Brazilians adhered to this imperial mode of employment and successfully recruited hundreds of thousands of Europeans to supplement enslaved labor in the years following the legal, the legal suspension of the transatlantic African slave trade in 1851. Therefore, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Negro also emerged in symbolic references to light-skinned workers of a low servo status. Indeed, the 19th century Brazilian terms and conditions of indentured servitude intersected with slavery in so many profound ways that for a number of appalled abolitionists, elite Brazilians were enforcing a clandestine <coughs> practice of white slavery, escravatura branca. Regardless of elite Brazilians' aspiration to constitute a, a white national working class, records such as the aforementioned consular letter attest to the paradigm of cross-racial victimization permeating Brazil's social history and counter a tendency to artificially separate the histories of disenfranchised blacks, indigenous, and whites. Uh, as well as to abolish the memory of shared suffering and potentially mutual identifications. I propose to further our knowledge of the overlapping histories of slavery and immigration in Brazil, especially the cross-currents of black and Portuguese diasporas, through an examination of the ambivalent racial renderings of low-status Portuguese immigrants during Rio's long abolition period that is, the four, decades of, uh, uh, the four last decades of slavery and the Brazilian post-independence monarchy, also known as empire. As Luis Felipe de Alencastro suggests, the intimate relations between European labor immigration and African slavery changed the Brazilian elite's parameters of whiteness. <laughs> For the first time in their lives, elite Brazilians realized the existence of a massive group of poor white Europeans who performed tasks and personified forms of social decadence that had been exclusively associated with blacks and mulattoes. Were these immigrants considered capable simultaneously of preserving their white identities and of transgressing specific racial divisions of labor, social conviviality, and moral conduct? As a cultural critic, 
I seek to know what mid to late 19th century discourses of immigration can tell us about the shifty parameters of whiteness or what it meant to be or become white in those years of nation formation. As Anup Nayak argues, whiteness should, not, uh, should, be, sorry, should be approached as less a matter of skin pigmentation and more as an organizing principle in late modernity. In Matt Ray's terms, whiteness involves a historically and culturally circumscribed <coughs> set of social and symbolic boundaries that give shape power and meaning to the social category white. In this sense, as Liv Sovic, Jeffrey Lasser, and others have demonstrated, certain conventional boundaries of whiteness, such as racial purity <coughs> and nationality, tend to be more flexible and permeable in countries like Brazil, where modern national elites have invested mightily in the politics of racial whiteness, whitening. Hence, for instance, the inclusion of socially ascendant mulattos and Asian Brazilians in the privileged category of white Brazilians, in order that, lumped together, they may outcome the country's black majority. As I demonstrate in today's presentation, specific whiteness boundaries were hotly debated in mid-19th century Rio in inter by intellectuals engaged in fixing the white-black ratio in Brazilian society by campaigning for European immigration. At the same time, this generation also felt pressured to decide whether the moral and physiological effects of bonded servitude as well as permanent residence in the tropics would exclude these immigrants from normative whiteness. As we know, the problem of white acclimatization in tropical empires was central to the saga of European imperialism up until its post-war downfall. However, at issue in this pre-Pasturian generation of, of intellectuals was Europeans' ability to survive in tropical conditions and preserve a biological-derived white identity. Further generations of lusotropicalist intellectuals, such as Silvio Romero and later Gilberto Freire, would evoke the Portuguese vocational cosmopolitanism and cultural plasticity or even mixed race ancestry in order to claim the Portuguese settlers and immigrants' exceptional aptitude to prosper in the tropics. The generation of intellectuals I wish to examine prefer to think that the process of, of acclimatization of poor white Europeans should be rationalized, disciplined, and strictly policed in order to prevent white racial degeneration or depauperation. This term is kind of weird in English, right? In Portuguese, we say depauperamento, like the impoverishment, impoverishment of the, the, the physical and mental functions no, of, of a body. Uh, of these, for these intellectuals, the degeneration of non-acclimatized immigrants implicated individual physio physiological and cognitive decline, but also from the point of view of racial categories, the threat of a white genocide on a large scale. The rest of my talk will address this generation's political dilemmas as they found themselves caught by a proto-eugenicist agenda favoring European immigration and a fear of white ex extinction that the massive migration of Europeans to the tropics was believed to entail. For my presentation today, I analyze a few chronicles, chronicles uh, in Brazilian writer uh, Joaquim Manuel de Macedo's bi-weekly newspaper columns, A Semana, The Week, from 1854 through 1859, and Labirinto, Labyrinth, in 1860. Both columns appeared in Rio's, I have, um, let me show here, uh, this is a map, an old map of Rio, uh, 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 um, 
around the time that I'm analyzing the Portuguese living there, uh, late uh, 50s in the 19th century. They all lived in the inner city in slums, uh, slum tenements. Um, and this is, um, um, you know, just the face of the writer that I am analyzing today, Joaquim Manuel de Macedo. Are you familiar with this writer, 19th century writer, um, Joaquim Manuel de Macedo? Um, uh, so um, I'm analyzing from uh, uh, two newspaper uh, columns uh, that uh, both uh, columns appeared in Rio's uh, recent extinct um, Jornal do Comércio. Although Macedo is most uh, um, uh, known nowadays for his best-selling romantic novel, A Moreninha, Little Brown Girl, I have uh, uh, some pictures of uh, the uh, hundreds of editions of A Moreninha, I particularly like this cover here, you know? <laughs> Very interesting. So he's more, you know, nowadays known for, for this novel, uh, published in 1844. It's considered like the first novel uh, published uh, in Brazil. Uh, in addition of being, uh, in addition to being, sorry, a celebrated uh, white male writer, journalist, physician, and politician, he had a prolific inte intellectual career publishing several novels, plays, memoirs, history and medical books, as well as collaborating assiduously as a cronista in several prestigious newspaper and literary journals. As we can observe from his chronicles on European immigration, Macedo's generation seemed at odds with defining and dealing socially and symbolic with a fast-growing urban population of poor whites regularly identified with the Portuguese. In Macedo's view, uh, political independence from, from Portugal had not stopped the former colony from serving as the main dumping ground of the imperial uh, human trash, men and to a less extent women associated with all sorts of conventionally shameful behavior and lifestyle from work abandonment and vagrancy to alcoholism, gambling and prostitution. The Portuguese acts of barbarism were particularly troublesome for an, for an intellectual from Macedo's milieu, given that misconduct was then believed to compromise the immigrant's capacity to survive and prosper in Rio's environment. The downgrading imaginings of the low status Portuguese, essentialized by disease and misconduct, were intimate, intimately connected with 19th century Rio's inner city slums where immigrants usually lived and socialized. I think I got a, a photo here of a typical 19th century slum tenement in, in Rio. There, there are still a few in the um, uh, center of Rio. A few slums survived from a, a series of demolition in late 19th century and early 20th century. So this is uh, one, just to give you an idea of where most of these immigrants who used to, to live in, in Rio, right? So um, um, I thus conclude my presentation by engaging with the medical epistem epistemologies shaping the conversations about immigration in those years. As I argue, Brazilian doctors' own contributions to the European acclimatization debate represented an important venue in which to encode norms of conduct for the growing poor white population in Brazil's major cities. In mid to late 19th century Brazil's extremely racist, racist, racist society, Portuguese immigrants' misconduct represented a transgression that threatened to equate poor whites with blacks. Therefore, as I claim, the acclimatization debate in Brazil emerged as a utilitarian means of defining and maintaining strategic boundaries of whiteness. Given the fact that at least 20% of immigration activity in mid to late 19th century Brazil was undocumented, it is challenging to measure the size and cultural implications of Rio's Portuguese diaspora through conventional consular records. On the other hand, 
these records do reveal that at least half of the European immigrants in Rio in those decades were Portuguese from the mainland, especially from the northern uh, Minho region, and the Azores, mostly from the islands of Terceira and São Miguel. The transatlantic circuit of scandalous stories of escravatura branca, white slavery, in Brazilian coffee plantations through newspapers, as well as consular and personal correspondence, may have influenced the propensity among the Portuguese to settle in cities, especially in Rio. Besides, the demand for a variegated labor force made Rio a major center for the importation of both enslaved and contract immigrant workers with profound consequences for its social dynamics. The high proportion of Rio's European residents performing unqualified services associated with freed and, and enslaved blacks and not rarely falling victim to other forms of social decline produce confusion and certainly discomfort to the local elites whose own sense of racial superiority relied on the naturalized equation of Europeanness, wealth, and respectability. Given the, raci the ra racialization of servitude in the New World nation with the longest lasting black uh, slavery regime, the Portuguese of low and servile status puzzled elite Brazilians with questions of race. Besides, how could these, immigra these immigrants be associated with servitude and degenerative misconduct and still be uniformly perceived as ideal widening agents? Notwithstanding the campaign of further generations of intellectuals to enhance Portuguese immigration for the sake of safeguarding the national racial stock from other ethnic influences, several mid to late 19th century intellectuals were more inclined to identify the proletarian Portuguese as a nation's burden too heavy to bear. This is precisely how writer Joaquim Manuel de Macedo rendered real poor white immigrants in a number of his cronicas, which construe the Portuguese in particular as indolent and unreliable, among other proof of their unsuitedness as labor providers. Macedo's conflict is quite evident in texts such as his chronica dated June 24, 1860, in which he anticipated the socially redeeming effects of European immigration and yet despised the elevated number of second-class whites whom the country had misfortunately tended to attract, attract. So I'm quoting him now. We've already had our own beggars and tons of mischief makers. We can easily live without the ones who arrive from abroad. We need men willing to work for, them, for themselves and in essence for the state as well. In this chronica, as well as in a previous one dated February 21st, 1859, Macedo laid out his view of the problem of the poor white immigrant. For him, elite Brazilian employers were critically deprived of the protection of free labor legislation to secure authority and control over the emerging working class. In, 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 in this earlier uh, chronica of 1859, he admitted that weak legislation could also sadly favor the reproachable abuses and barbarous treatment, which featured a number of work relations, relations in Rio's coffee plantations. He even defended a labor politics that favored the retention of indentured immigrant laborers in the major cities while concentrating enslaved labor within the rural areas. However, for the most part of this chronic and elsewhere, Macedo condemned the weakly legisla le legislated labor realities of, and I quote him, lazy and devious contract workers who barely and poorly served their masters 
As soon as they got paid for, the fir for their first month of work, they abandoned their jobs, and as long as they could live off that stipend, leisure, food, gambling, and alcohol took over their entire lives." End quote. Perhaps influenced by the several newspaper ads about runaway indentured servants, Macedo insisted that work abandon, abandonment, that is, breaking indentured contracts, was then the main obstacle for a successful immigration enterprise. In fact, just a few weeks previous to his Crónica of February 21, 1859, the Jornal do Comércio published a number of ads criminalizing fugitive Portuguese immigrants. Uh, in an ad, for, uh, for example, in an ad dated January uh, uh, 28, for, uh, uh, the fugitive immigrant was accused of stabbing a slave co-worker owned by a certain captain, Manuel Leite de Barros. The slave died and the immigrant ran away. As Henrique Espada Lima uh, argues, 19th century Rio's elites were particularly invested in finding ways to blur the boundaries between enslaved labor and contractual free work. Needless to say, the Portuguese immigrants' frequent escapes threatened to jeopardize the elite's investments to preserve a culture, of, a culture of servitude in the work environment. As we know, marunage, uh, marunage, the maroons, marunage, marunas, yeah, the, 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 the runaways is communities, uh, uh, represented the most organized and enduring form of resistance in the work sphere during slavery. Thus, it must have been the case that immigrant workers simply learned from their, from, from their slave co-workers which forms of resistance proved to be effective in Brazil. However, as is clear from the above quoted passage in Macedo's Crónica, such immigrants' work desertion was not framed from the outside as a form of protest but instead portrayed as a sign of their ill-formed character. Above all, it was seen as evidence of a deficient work ethic and a taste of vagab uh, vag vagabondage. vagabondage. Um, according to Macedo, uh, the ultimate proof of this immigrant's perversion was manifested, and I quote him, in the infamous crowds of vagabonds often to be found hanging inside or in front of bars. To the dismay of many honest families, there were also a number of Ilhoas or uh, Azorian women who, who, toward the end of, few of a few months, would exchange their slave-like obeyed dignify, dignifying employment as housemaids uh, for a life of the worst of all miseries, that is, prostitution. Macedo concluded his crónica with an appeal to the proper authorities to produce a legal apparatus that would attract Europeans willing to serve the country with their labor and superior race. In his terms, immigration laws should target married Christian couples, including non-Catholics, and should include legislation to fix the immigrant in the workplace, thus preventing him or her from falling victim uh, to indolence, perversion, and addictions. According to Macedo, through such a path of conventional moralism and hard work, immigration could function as a redeeming process, thus eventually even allowing the lowly Portuguese, and I quote him, to leave the pestilent slums where they usually sought shelter for the big and majestic castles that they would be eligible to build. 
Macedo's conditional anticipation of the Portuguese immigrants' economic ascension, albeit evoked with ultra-optimistic images of splendid castles, certainly reveal that despite being cast as disruptive and socially use useless, European immigrants weren't, after all, denied the white privilege of upward social mobility. On the other hand, implied in Macedo's wishful thinking about Europeans' prosperity was the belief that permanence in pestilent slums would damage their health, labor aptitude, and integrity. In fact, his implicit anxiety about immigrants' degeneration in, in infectious Islam lands was a typical paranoid reaction of his privileged class against white Islam dwelling. As I demonstrate in the remainder of my presentation, Brazilian doctors in particular were invested in construing Rio's early slums as a place in many ways improper for whites, with negative impacts on European immigration's acclimatization. In Catherine McKittrick's terms, Europeans' long-term residence in slums was treated as a, as a transgression of existing cartographic rules which organize social racial hierarchies in place. In mid to late 19th century Brazilian medical thought, this, subver this sub subversive self-placement or choice of residence was seen as doubly threatening. It was symbolically cast as transgressive social ra racial boundary crossing, and from a clinical perspective, it impeded white Europeans' capacity to survive and reproduce in Rio's new environment. According to Sidney Shalhoub, Rio's inner city slums entered the public discourse as early as uh, 1850s, when intellectuals and medical professionals turned the city's diverse form of popular housing into a public health issue of the highest priority. As Alan Main argues, the term Islam, in Portuguese, curtiço, uh, carries an array of socially biased meanings that have served as a stumbling block for scholars searching for the geographic stories of, um, of blacks and, white, uh, or, and poor white folks in 19th century Rio. For the purposes of this presentation, it is important to mention that the Islam stereotype portrayed the private lives of Rio's immigrant poor whites in essentially negative terms from promiscuity, disorder, alcoholism, uh, uh, to poor hygiene standards and conviviality with blacks. Additionally, Islam dwelling immigrants were seen as particularly prone to succumb to certain lethal ep epidemic diseases, especially the yellow fever, uh, febre amarela, which according to the period's official obituary statistics killed more poor white foreigners than Afro-Brazilians. In fact, before the insect vector discoveries in late 19th century, yellow fever emerged as an international emblem of white extermination in the hot and, and wet tropical lowlands. As Brazilian statesman Rui Barbosa would lament a few decades later, such a, and I'm quoting him, such a pro-black and xenophobic disease had sadly given Brazil its, int its international reputation as a slaughterhouse of the white race. 
In order to claim their own authority in the Eurocentric field of tropical medicine, Brazilian physicians challenged the, the nation's morbid international reputation, which according to them had caused doctors such as the British Robert Dundas and the French Marc Boudin to endorse the myth about whites' ineptitude to acclimatize and survive in the tropics. To be sure, these Brazilian doctors did not challenge the then prevailing miasmatic theory defining the origin and spread of disease. Still, through academic affiliations, collaborations in medical journals, and even through the foundation in the, in the in 1860s of the Bahian uh, tropicalist school, Brazilian doctors attempted to challenge tropical fatalism by adopting a, hyg a, hyg hygienist, um, a hygienist principle that blamed poorly built filthy and of overpopulated slums for the decline of the immigrants' physical and mental health. For example, in a passage of his work, Do Aclimamento, of Acc Acclimatization, uh, that reminds me of Macedo's previous analyzed crónica, Dr. João Vicente Torres Homem, condemned the long-term residence of many Portuguese in toxic slums, I quote him, where humidity, heat, vicious air, and a variety of pestilent emanations prevailed. And recommended, the same doctor recommended the immediate removal of these immigrants to Rio's elevated neighborhoods or other localities atop the, the, the cities surrounding hills. I think I have uh, some pictures of this doctor. He was uh, considered one of the most important doctors of uh, Rio at that time. Um, according to some encyclopedias, he was a uh, like the founder of uh, medical science in Brazil. So um, I've, I'm researching some of his essays on immigration and acclimatization. Uh, okay, uh, it is beyond the scope of my presentation to describe the controversial debate of acclimatization that according to Warwick Anderson, came to mobilize a wide variety a wide variety of economies and knowledge production for the sake of imperial gain. I simply draw from Brazilian intellectuals and doctors original contributions to this transatlantic debate in order to demonstrate the under-examined narratives of white degeneration and white genocide that help to frame discourses of immigration in Brazil. Additionally, I rely on the overlapping discourses of immigration and acclimatization in order to interrogate the shifty parameters of whiteness vis-a-vis -vis Rio's fast-growing population of poor white immigrants in bonded servitude and other forms of social decline, decline associated with the blacks. As Pascal Grosse argues, even European doctors who try to prove the whites' capacity to acclimatize in the intertropical, intertropical zone had to convince themselves and others that the organic alterations these immigrants were believed to undergo in the new climatic environment would not involve a loss of their biological correct characteristics as whites. In Brazil, doctors were challenged to produce their own epistemologies of acclimatization that sim simultaneously supported whites' physiological transformation and racial stability in their new habitat. On the other hand, the same doctors were pressured to propose a rigorous biopolitics of vigilance and contr control over these immigrants' dietary habits, lifestyle, as well as living and working conditions in order to stem the perceived increase of trashy whites in Brazil's major cities. 
At the outset of my presentation, I alluded to the, to the use of the slur white Negroes in derogatory reference to low status Portuguese as a means to interrogate the boundaries of normative whiteness as well as the meanings of the social racial category white in mid to late 19th century Brazilian society. Given the conflation of blackness and servitude in, in pre-abolition Brazil, elite Brazilians try to resolve the paradox of white indentured servitude through symbolic actions and social relations that ultimately denied unconditional whiteness to most European immigrants. The ambivalent racial imaginary concerning Portuguese immigrants thus helped to maintain Brazil's deeply ingrained culture of servitude, one scientifically validated in a number of local medical hygienist pamph pamphlets about acclimatization. Additionally, as previously said, Brazilian doctors sought to redeem the morbid reputation of tropical countries like Brazil by way of focusing on the degenerative anti-hygienic lifestyle of the country's massive population of poor white Portuguese. According to the above-quoted above physician Torres Homem, not only the Portuguese economic poverty, but also their sickly ambition led these immigrants in particular to live the decadent life of real social, racial, lowly populations. As I argue elsewhere, such renderings of Portuguese immigration in Brazil as a sign of bodily and, uh, and moral decay inadvertently supported imperialist settlement of Portuguese uh, in Lusophone Africa, the British Caribbean, and Hawaii. By reinforcing poor immigrants' conditional whiteness, Brazilian intellectuals also ended up at odds with their own pro-whitening campaigns to convince the state to subsidize European labor immigration. However, such dilemmas defining the early debates on European immigration went omitted from the mainstream historiography of the so-called Great Immigration Period, which failed to recognize that European immigrants were not be perceived as unconditionally white by Brazilian local elites and were certainly, certainly not uniformly endorsed as national whitening agents. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think I convinced your audience. Okay. <laughs> um, May I kick off the first question? So I think you framed in the first part of your, your presentation the, the ways in which you're using critical white, whiteness studies yes. as, a, as, a, as a framework for this. Yeah. How, do you, how do you navigate, this is a political question I'm asking, how do you navigate mm -hmm. um, a critique of your work that I can see some people saying is that are you, are you not in a way diminishing the, re, the really different realities the time of black people, they, right, right, and white people, and if even at the time, scientists and politicians and intellectuals yeah. are very concerned about them, we can see within one generation, black people are still in the same social yeah. status, and and, and 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 the, the immigrants and ascended, exactly. yeah, so yeah. That, so that even though, yeah, even though there is this discrimination that Italian workers, that Portuguese and mm -hmm. Spaniards will yeah. experience in Brazil. Right because they've been pushed into the same social status as people who are considered inferior, right. their whiteness privilege takes them out of that. It's in, yeah. in, within a generation, probably. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. I mean, maybe, or maybe the studies indicates it's two generations, but I would assume it would be one and a half generations or two generations that would be out of that status. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying that um, the processes of victimization are the same. Um, that's, I'm, I'm far from, from saying that, you know. Uh, but I think that um, uh, it is interesting to look at the, uh, let's say, the moment of arrival of these immigrants and their uh, struggle 
to become, to be considered white and, and gain white privilege in that racist environment. I mean, uh, the trajectory is predictable. We, we, know, we know what happened, right? But I think that, the, 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 that those individual histories of struggle and what that can tell us or, 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 or how that can complicate our understanding of, uh, of the category of white is, is what I am uh, interested in. Uh, in you know, kind of a grasping. No, I'm just complicating uh, our systems of differences and, and trying to to see nuances. You know, instead of just saying you know, on one side, on one hand you have the blacks and the whites, and all whites uh, uh, have the same privileges. No, I'm I'm just you know showing the all the nuances, but but far from from saying that you know. Uh, uh, these immigrants were, th that's why, you know, I, I, sometimes I see expressions like blackened, blackened immigrants. Um, I, I, I prefer to use more, uh, 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 I, I prefer to understand this as more like ambivalent. There is an ambivalence or some, some troubles trying to define their uh, racial identity, more than saying that they are, you know, uh, uh, that they became black. I think it simplifies the process. If I may, yeah. I mean, I think mm. what's exciting about your work, and I really enjoyed talking to you last night about it and, and, and hearing your talk today, is that it really shows the weight of the ideology of slavery and how slavery is so um, linked to menial labor and, and the disdain yeah. of menial labor by middle classes and upper classes, which we know is continues to this very day. Right, right. That um, it, people who are doing menial labor be, become, you know, it becomes conflated with, with the ideology of racism in the country. In a very yes. Way. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Thanks, Nelson. Uh, um, thank you, Sonia. Provocative presentation. Thank and, you. Um, got many of us thinking in different ways and following a little bit of what uh, Jim said uh, about what um, slavery mm -hmm. and uh, menial labor means with regard to Brazil. I'm also curious from the point of view of the Portuguese immigrant, mm -hmm. how does the social political atmosphere of lusophobia Mm -hmm. Right. Lusophobia. Plays, mm -hmm. yeah. Which reigned, you know, at that time, uh -huh, contributes uh, to this issue. Um, I think many people see, I mean, if you think of like the piada portuguese. Right, <laughs> yeah. That, many people see this as um, more of a economic issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you're, you're raising here is the uh, intersection of race and uh, economics. Huh? So I'm just wondering if you know, considering also beyond the immediate scenario of mm -hmm. the Jesus and all that, mm -hmm. just what the overall yeah. uh, temper was in terms right. of yeah. Portuguese immigration, yeah. and particularly that. Because yeah. what, no. what I read a lot in 19th century right. is, yeah. is this yeah. lusophobia. Very strong, very strong, yeah. Uh, I am, um, I, I, sometimes I think that the studies about the lusophobia they're more uh, focused on the, uh, like the Portuguese entrepreneurs because they owned uh, lots of uh, uh, like small businesses in Rio, uh, including Curtiços, right? They were, uh, many Portuguese, they were slum owners. Um, and, um, and, and so uh, my idea here was to look at that majority of uh, the, the manual laborers, right? The, the indenture, the ones in Bonden, in this sort of uh, semi-slavery uh, situation, and also the ones that they claimed were like the beggars, the, the, the vagabonds, the vagrants in the city, you know? Um, but, but, but certainly, I think lusophobia, uh, this is a, a just like a small part of a chapter, a chapter where in which I actually talk about this um, um, attitude you know, against Portuguese. I mean, this is uh, just a few decades after independence, so of course you have a lot of that playing also. No? Uh, so you're adding one more element, which I think it's, uh, it's really important. Thanks for, yeah. What the is comment, important yeah. about your work is, um, is, is that you're showing the, you know, many dimensions of race in Brazil mm -hmm. that right. really surfaces uh, in, in this particular situation, yes. but how that particular situation is an affront 
uh, to present it in terms of what they see as white. And, uh, and I think that uh, yeah. you know, I applaud you for the work because yeah. I think it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, especially because those elites, they, you know, they were, you know, they, they, they saw themselves as, uh, as Portuguese descendants, right? So, so how would they, could they keep uh, thinking of themselves as these um, superior, right, class of citizens and at the same time seeing that the reality of the majority of Portuguese, you know, um, uh, circulating in the city. You know? And what I think it's interesting here is to see how in terms of the foundational fictions of Brazil, I mean at this time uh, uh, the major writers, they are talking about the first settlers, right, as the you know, the ones who brought the um, civilization and, and, and you know, all those good things related to white race. You know? so, so you see I just wanted to complicate that to see that you know while there was this uh, mystification of the first settlers, they were at the same time dealing on their like daily you know basis with these uh, poor whites that you know they were associating with you know blacks and living with blacks in the slums or begging or uh, killing you know associated with crimes to prostitution also. Um, that's why I'm saying, I mean, I know that the trajectories of poor whites and blacks are different, but I wanted to kind of look at, you know, those first decades, you no, know, and see those complications, you no, know, but without uh, saying that it's the same thing, right? Are you going yeah. to include or make reference to, because uh, I don't know, the span of, you know, historical span of your study, um, but, uh, you know, talk about Cortes, so we talk about Luis right. Residente, and, yeah. and we have, you know, yes. not only the, the Portuguese boss, but we also have under him the Portuguese, or, yeah. you know, menial laborers and so right. forth. Yes. Um, I think those are very, very illustrative. Absolutely, yeah. I think Luis Azevedo is a, is a great example. He shows that what I'm talking about here, this process of degeneration, right? You, you have that Geronimo, right, the, the, the hard worker who, loses, right, his, his racial, right, um, uh, abilities, right, or, or how can I say, the, 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 the yeah, I mean, he, he becomes, yeah, like a, a alcoholic, and so, so that, that is what interests me, yes, I will. I, I'm, I'm thinking of a chapter on um, uh, what I'm trying to elaborate, a, a concept of a proletarian entrepreneur. So I'm talking about the, 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 the slum owners. And also one thing that I'm interested in is the kiosks, mm -hmm. the real, uh, the, the old kiosks that were turned into like um, uh, bar, not bars, I don't know how to say that, but you know, they, this, Rio used to ha have, like in the uh, late 19th century, there were uh, kiosks that were imported from Europe. And, you know, it was a way of um, uh, bringing to Rio the elegance and the sort of businesses that Lisbon or Paris used to have. And those kiosks were transformed into places that attracted, like, uh, uh, manual laborers who used to go there and gather and have have cachaça or bolinho de bacalhau, those kind. And and, and most of these kiosks they were owned by Portuguese. So I want to work in a separate uh, part, you know, dealing with that area. A Luiz Azevedo, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Don't be intimidated by two professors asking questions first. Right. <laughs> <laughs> were there any like terms that I was using that were not clear? I mean, I'm talking about acclimatization. Was is that clear when I talk about that? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I, I mean, in the 19th century, there was a, a whole discussion, right, in Europe, and uh, so I was interested in seeing how uh, Brazilian doctors. Um, um, entered you know, this uh, debate you know, on um, what they were trying to understand if it was uh, possible or not for uh, white people, basically, right, to uh, keep their white characteristics you know, once they moved to tropical zones. You know? 
um, especially at a time uh, uh, when there were lots of migrations of uh, Europeans to the, the colonies, right? It's a time of imperialism, so, so many whites were moving to Africa, uh, to the Caribbean, uh, to Asia, um, so, so they were um, debating you know, about that, to you know if these uh, uh, immigrants would be able to keep their features, you know, or if there would be um, any sort of uh, degeneration you know, going on. Don't, so, don't, sorry, yeah. don't you think that the whiteness never really disappeared? Like yeah. Manual laborers? Oh, never, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Nowadays in Brazil, this discussion of poor white is coming back with the affirmative action. And you can see, you can see many whites, you know, poor whites saying that they, they also should be uh, contemplated and included in, in affirmative action because they also don't, didn't have the same privilege as, uh, as rich whites. So you, you're kind of seeing a, a debate nowadays uh, uh, that I think it's very interesting. Uh, you know, people trying to define this area you know, that I'm, I'm calling white trash just as a provocation. Because you know? in Brazil, we never had a similar term. The only one that I found was this one, white Negro, you know? showing, you know, or giving an illusion that, that, that people were differentiating, right? Whites from whites, you know? Um, but, uh, but it's kind of coming back, yeah. Ra I think Ramon wanted to, okay. Yeah, I, I was just, um, um, I, I found the, the presentation really interesting and provocative and, and the work is important. Um, I was just, I, I, I felt sometimes listening to like, it's a comment more than a, a question, uh, that a couple of things. Some mm -hmm. of the terms that you were using were, were very provocative and then it wasn't clear until later that you were really referencing the terminology that, that was being used by the thinkers. So I would be careful with those terms, like <laughs> okay. white discrimination, white genocide. Oh, uh, okay. Like, like, yeah, I have a lot of quotes have here. Quotes I should here. I should have so, done like this, yeah. Those terms yeah, because, yeah. Because those terms are being used by some other people right now. Um, and and, and um, the other thing that I was going to say is that I, I think um, what what was there in the in, in the in the presentation, but that I wanted you to tap into more was mm. it, it more than kind of st stretching what whiteness is. Mm. It, it seems to me that it's a story about how these thinkers mm. and these elites have all of these paranoias and neuroses about white what whiteness is. And um, I, I got that from the presentation, but I wanted you to go deeper into that, mm. specifically, mm. you know, what, mm. what whiteness means to this group of people. Because it's, it didn't seem as convincing to me that, um, that any aspect of, the, of, of privileges attached to whiteness and separations between different types of menial labor and all of that was, was, was that, that starkly challenged by, by, by there being poor whites. It's more, that, that piece was the piece that I was, I was mm. wanting to hear more and more about mm. was, 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 you know, how, how's that developing over history? And, 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 and how does that also relate to the whole idea of whitening the population? Because that, that common framing, I just wanted to know more about that and, and hear a little bit more yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. I think I was, um, I was um, uh, trying, what I was trying to say here is that uh, definitely um, this is a generation um, that started to think more uh, in, uh, of what that, what was the meaning of white at the, at the time that they start to um, um, live with um, uh, a, a new class of whites uh, becoming more. It's not like, it's not just, I'm not even saying that um, there weren't before poor whites in Brazil. It's not that they, but it's, it's, it's that massive presence uh, in the slums, in, in these jobs associated with blacks. So, so, so that presence was um, making them reflect on their own parameters of, of whiteness. So 
Uh, but but I, I, I think that if I'm following you, what you're saying that, okay, so after that, what do they do about it, right? That's what why you wanted me it? to. Um, right, what do they yeah. do about it? What are some of, the, some of the core issues coming up? How do they flesh it out? All of that right. stuff. It seems as much as, as a history of, um, of, 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 you know, talking about the, the, the massive immigration, it seems like an intellectual history of, of how people are responding to that. And, and how it relates to their aspirations for the country mm -hmm. and all of these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I think you, yeah, yes. I just want a bit more clarification on, sure. uh, particularly uh, Dr. Jal Omem, and like, in terms of what kind of role they were playing, I didn't really understand what kind of role they were playing right. in the era in terms of, were they confirming, were they analyzing the kind of um, anthropologically the areas and, and, and building their own? Yeah, th these doctors, I think it's something interesting. I mean, I, of course, I didn't have time to uh, show more what they were doing, but um, um, these doctors, they were um, trying to counter studies that were being uh, published in Europe yep. about um, extermination, I mean, not extermination, but like genocide of white people. No, I mean, there were, uh, I, I mentioned here, one French doctor called Marc Boudin. Yes. He was very against the, the uh, sending whites to uh, tropical countries because according to him, it, it was a disaster. Uh, whites were, were dying everywhere. So uh, these doctors, they were basically claiming that because, I mean, at that time, disease was uh, associated with places. I mean, this is a time when people didn't think that, in their minds, you know, yellow fever was not caused by, by a mosquito, right? By, you know, the mosquito yeah. as a vector, right? Uh, is spreading uh, the disease. For them, it was, um, it was something that they called the miasma. Uh, like, you know, in certain areas of Rio, especially where slums were built, they believed that there were some um, uh, vapors uh, coming from the soil that, according to them, were humid and, and, and full of organic uh, things, you no know, deteriorating, you no, know, especially because in their minds, you know, the slum people, they, you know, they didn't take care of the trash. So they were bearing trash. So at, 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 at that, those areas were being were uh, producing uh, toxic airs, right? And those uh, those areas, uh, because of the toxic airs, people were getting um, sick, right? So this is the miasma. So this doctor, he that, has. Was that um, particularly for, did they believe that was particularly affecting white people in the tropics? Yes, because uh, there were um, um, uh, studies showing. Um, that um, uh, especially foreigners, that the, the, the white foreigners, they were getting uh, more uh, uh, killed than any other uh, population in Brazil. They were the ones uh, like the, the, the victims, you know, the main victims of uh, yellow fever. You know? was, that, was that the um, case or was that just them having a kind of agenda? Like, was that the reality of the situation? Um, according to these doctors, yes. And I think that it may, I mean, I, I never spoke with a doctor nowadays. Yeah. Probably they would say that um, uh, the fact that they were not exposed to, uh, to the Aegis uh, is, is Egypti, the, 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 the mosquito, no? Maybe because of a, a lack of um, exposure, no, they were more susceptible to fall victim to that. But they were, you know, they were basing their studies on numbers of victims that that there were more victims. No, uh, I don't think that the Brazilian doctors were denying this. Europeans were saying that because the yellow fever was everywhere. Yeah. So the, the the Europeans were saying that. Brazilians were not denying. What they insisted was that the problem was not the tropical climate. They were saying that it had to do with the lifestyle of these immigrants. They should not be living in those slums. Of course, they were not, in, I mean, they were not concerned, uh, concerned about the blacks living in the slums, right? And, and Sidney Shalhoub, your, your colleague, he says that the yellow fever became like the most 
uh, debated disease in Brazil because it was killing whites, you know? If it was killing blacks, probably the doctors were not being so invested in, in analyzing that, you know? But I think that there was some, uh, like, oops, some statistics proving that, yes, that there were more white people uh, dying, yeah, of the, the fever, yeah. Nowadays in Brazil, we have another surge, right, of a yellow fever. <laughs> so things are coming back. Yeah. Do we have time for another question? Yeah, may I? Um, so could you, mm. I mean, very provocative title, and um, the, the, I, I, my first question this one are, are like, preventing you from falling to pitfalls and critiques of your work that will discredit it. Yeah. People who find something right. you know, yeah. offensive. Oh, about especially, it or, uh, yeah, people right, so in the, doing whiteness studies, right, so, no? So, yeah. So the, mm -hmm. question of, the question of yeah. white trash as being, and I have not thought about this very much until this very moment, so I might be saying something <laughs> very stupid, but as a group of white people who permanently are poor, degenerate, in a state of being that they won't stay out of, which is over generations. And that's a social class of lower class bad white people compared to what might, I guess the question, mm -hmm. it's going to my first question and even what Ramon asked, which is the power of the idea of the need to white in the country, which becomes really very visible by the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And Skidmore and others have written about that, the right. ideology of the elites about we need to encourage this, right. especially as slavery clearly is going to end. Yeah. And we don't think that black can be good workers in the countryside. Yeah. We need to bring Europeans in and change right. the system. Is this a notion of these Portuguese as something that's a temporary situation, that which has to do with their immediate arrival and their poverty? That they're, at the time, are they seeing that those people will come out of this if we do a certain number of things to get them out of this? Or is this, oh my god, we've inherited a permanent class of white well, they didn't know what was going to happen Obviously. with these poor whites. I think that what complicates the, the generation I'm studying here versus the one that you just mentioned is the fact that this immigration is happening at a time when Brazil still had slavery. And I think that that complicates. That, that's, that's all. I mean, of course, whitening as a, as a politics, no? I mean, uh, um, uh, encouraging a politics of immigration becomes even more important um, towards the end of, of the 19th century. But, it, but the mid-century intellectuals, they are still thinking in terms of widening through immigration. Yeah, they're encouraging it. Yeah. There was a whole debate about if Brazilians should or should not bring Chinese Right, and 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 it's they were very clear, but saying no, we we, we don't want we don't want a you know this non-white uh, group. So they they really wanted to widen through immigration at that time, maybe less uh, 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 emphatic as as the the next generation. No, but at that time with slavery, I think it's interesting. Luis Felipe de Alencastro, I think, is one historian who started that provocation, but I didn't see. Uh, uh, follow-up of, of his uh, important work that is called the Slaves and Proletarians, Escravos e Proletarios. He published like in late 80s, um, and, um, and and that you know was one article that I I, I felt it was fascinating, you know, and I wanted to to go and check the what the the writers at that time were saying about these immigrants. So, yeah. One last question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about a brief comment you made mm -hmm. in terms of like slavery and immigration when it comes to rural versus urban environments. Right. I think one of the writers you mentioned in your presentation was yeah. saying that you know, it was, um, uh, you know, blacks should be confined to rural environments. Yeah. Or something like, is that what yeah. you're saying? So like, yeah. I'm, I'm, not a, I, I'm not a historian of Brazil. But I know in, in the U.S., during the 18, the sort of early 19th century, um, when like slavery was still predominant, but there were also waves of um, immigration from right. Europe um, with sort of Irish and Scandinavian, right. especially right. Um, immigrants that like in cities in like the north and the south of the U.S., mm -hmm. um, there were efforts. There were a lot of race riots where. Um, 
you know, Africans um, were kicked out of the cities, and you know, they, or they would be captured by, um, you know, sort of the emerging patrols. Um, and so I was wondering, you mentioned that uh, yeah. that thing about sort of rural versus yes. Where was was there were there similar movements in Brazil during that time? Yeah, um, and to sort of push. Yeah, yeah, and uh, actually that uh, in fact happened that in, in Brazil, the decades before uh, abolition that only happened in the late 80s, no? Um, uh, slaves were uh, gradually being uh, pushed to the plantations areas, no? I mean, uh, the cities, they are like uh, censuses, no? And statistics showing uh, that most of the jobs, the, the urban jobs, they were in the hands of uh, freed, I mean, freed blacks too, no? But freed uh, workers, no? Um, they're, they're, the, the census of 1872, I think, already shows that, you know? So we know uh, that they were pushing slaves. For, for this uh, a writer in particular, it, this would be a solution to avoid the scandals that Brazil was, you know, associated with of, uh, of enslaving uh, white people. So according to them, the plantation owners, they were more prone to treat their workers as slaves because, because they were not used to uh, deal with free workers. So for them, the, uh, uh, keeping these immigrants in the cities would um, actually protect them from these uh, uh, mistreatment, you know? That, that, that's, that's how he, he thought. But, but you know, indentured servitude was also taking place in the cities, you know? Uh, also, another topic that I didn't find uh, uh, many studies about, you know? Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about, uh, do, are you familiar with the term indentured servitude? No, I mean, in the U.S. had, right? Uh, the, you mentioned the Irish, right, in the 18th century, right? They were on uh, uh, contracts uh, that, it, or we could call uh, uh, contratos de dívida, no? Con uh, that contract, right, that you, um, you were employed by someone, who uh, was uh, the person that paid for your um, uh, trip to, uh, to, in the case to Brazil, someone would pay for your trip, for your clothes, your food, so they because had, later, right? right? What's so that? This is later, even into the 20th century with the Japanese, the Japanese began to arrive in Brazil in 1908, and a lot of them were it was under a system of exactly. indenture. Exactly. And that's the Italians. The Italians, the Italians too. Before. Yeah. But the Italians before. No, but the yeah. Italians, even in the twenty in the early twentieth century, that there were some moments of uh, diplomatic issues between Brazil and Italy because of these. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's why I think that we still need to study more on this. I mean, Alain Castro, this Brazilian historian, he says that indentured servitude in Brazil hmm. only took place uh, in, um, in the 50s, and probably somehow in the 60s, in, in 18th century, only mid 19th century. So, but we know, we know that, that this practice persisted in Brazil, no? So, Probably there will be more studies, no, showing that, no, yeah. Thank you very okay. Much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks for for the. All the